Hey everybody, what is going on? Hexlax here. I got another Master of Duel video for you. So, uh, I noticed that in both the YouTube comments as well as uh, people just chatting on the stream, uh, that I've had a lot of people say that they liked my Kashira Zodiac build that I showed off uh, a couple of times within the past few months or so, uh, saying that it put in a lot of work for them. And I think that's really cool because I really, really like this deck. Uh, so I figured I'd come back to it, play it a little bit more, and just uh, recap it for those who uh, both enjoy seeing this deck in action and those who might not be familiar with it. So, uh, Cashier is Zodiac, it's a, I mean, it's a pretty simple concept, right? Um, because the idea here is that the... Uh, um, we're playing a cashier package, like we're playing the Unicorn, the Fenrir, the uh, Right Soth, as well as the Birth, but we also get to play a small additional package of Rise Heart plus Cashier Theosis, just one copy of each. Uh, this does lock us into Exceed Summons, but thankfully the other archetype we're matched up with uh, these cashiers is going to be with Zodiac, uh, so that means, of course, that they don't really care about being Xyz locked. So. Uh, yeah, with like Snake Eye and a lot of other decks where you splash Kashira, uh, you don't get to include like the Rise from the Theos. It's mostly just like Unicorn and Fenrir, right? But uh, here we do actually have lines where we can potentially Era and a Rise Heart. Uh, but funnily enough, we didn't even end up doing that in any of the duels I'm going to show you. Uh, we were still able to actually have a very, very good win rate. Um, because honestly, the Zodiac package, it might not seem like it, but it can go pretty hard by itself. But I will say... Um, when building Zodiacs without Kashira, one thing and one thing that makes you want to splash into their engine with them uh, is that I've talked about this in the past few videos. Actually, I think uh, the idea of like engine to disruption ratio. Um, and how, you know, you, you want to have a balance of the two, right? And how even being 50-50 is actually not even bad at all, uh, because you're then very likely to open with both multiple uh, pieces of engine and multiple pieces of disruption, uh, meaning that you're good whether you go first or second, right? So the thing with Zodiacs here, right, is that, you know, once you include all, like, the Zodiac cards that you really, really want to see... Uh, you know, you're still looking at, like, 13 cards, including the three Fire Formation Techie, so in that regard... Um, and that also does include, of course, the uh, Zodiac Barrages as well. And it's like, yeah, we could just add more Zodiac monsters, but the thing that I don't really like about just adding more Zodiac monsters and playing this deck pure is that multiple Zodiac monsters in hand tend not to do much, except for if you have, like, Thoroughblade plus Ram Ram. Uh, if you open those two, then, yeah, you can go into your, your F-Zero line, right? But aside from that, it's like opening, again, multiple copies of these cards tends not to do a lot of the time that much for you. Um, so that's why I like having the Kashira package in here. This is more engine that we can play either separately from or in addition to our Zodiac stuff. Because if you think about it, right, uh, if you open even just like Unicorn plus any Zodiac monster, you can start by like, you know, especially Unicorn and then adding the Theosis and then going for uh, Fenrir and then doing that whole line to end on Era and then a Rizard, right? And if your opponent disrupts it, you know, that's fine. You can just slap down your Zodiac and then also throw down a Dryden. If your opponent disrupts it, or doesn't disrupt it, cool. You can still just normal summon the Thoroughblade and also have a Dryden in addition to that on, like, turn one, for example, right? Um, but a lot of the way that this deck really likes to keep control of the board is honestly just going for a big Zeus uh, with a lot of materials, usually six on it. Uh, that's three board wipes, and a lot of the time you don't even necessarily have to use the first board wipe, board wipe right away. Uh, and if you can save it, then ugh, it's even better. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely say, by the way, this is a control deck. Uh, now, when a lot of people think of control decks, they think of stuff like Labyrinth or Stun decks. Uh, I think Stun and Control are different. That could actually be its own video topic, honestly. But, um, you know, a lot of people think of these really heavily back row focused decks when they think of a control deck. Uh, what really a control deck means is it's a deck that is more likely to win the longer the game goes on. Or at the very least, it's a deck that doesn't plan on winning by OTKing and dealing all 8,000 damage in one turn. And you shouldn't expect to do that in this deck the vast majority of the time. There are some very rare instances where I'm sure you could do it, but um, more often than not, the way that we're going to win is by grinding our opponent out of advantage, right? Uh, we're often going to win after multiple turns of attacking directly while the opponent has like nothing ideally on their hand or field uh, because they've tried to throw all their resources at either comboing or stopping us and they're just not able to so um 
that's kind of the idea, I think, in general, uh, especially, well, I mean, in a lot of TCGs, you know, uh, a control deck is one that wants the game to go on longer, and and this, I think, is definitely one of those decks, because uh, because we're not OTKing much, that means a short game means that we're getting OTKed, right? So we want long games with this deck. Uh, and indeed, the duels that we're going to see are like, I have a 9-turn game, a 6-turn game, a 5-turn game, so uh, you can definitely expect to get some good back and forth, which I think is why people like this deck. Uh, not only is it strong and very capable against the current meta, um, and it can actually be very flexible and capable against any given meta, uh, I'll talk about that here in a moment, but on top of that, the games that you get with this are always going to be really good back and forth. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is, I've actually called this deck in the past the, the Meta Buster, uh, because this deck has a lot of room for hand traps, right? Um, again, our cash share package is minimal, Zodiac inherent is inherently already a minimal package, so we have room for like 20 pieces of disruption, and I kind of include triple attack in that, as being just a good disruption tool both on turn 1 and 2, right? So, um... On top of all of the regular stuff like uh, Nib and Valor and Imperm, and of course the Master Duel Tax, uh, there is also Dimension Shifter where you get to rock this card um, because we're not playing Pot of Avarice. I don't think you really need that in Zodiacs anymore uh, now that we have multiple copies of Dryden. I think putting back Dryden was the main draw of playing Pot of Avarice in, in a Zodiac deck for me in the past um, because there are games where you'll need multiple Drydens, but. Um, you don't really ever need more than two, and even if I really wanted more Drydens, I'd just probably play a third one instead of a main decking pot of Avarice, because D-Shifter, I don't think I need to tell you just how insanely good uh, this card in this meta is. Uh, I mean, it's good in general, like, generally speaking, any deck that can play D-Shifter should, but especially right now, uh, not only... Should, should, should any deck that uh, can play D-Shifter be doing it, but you also have extra incentive to be playing decks that can play D-Shifter uh, to help combat Snake Eye and uh, a lot of other graveyard-based strategies, which are, again, very prevalent in this meta. Uh, for the extra deck, I think the only thing that I'm really kind of missing that I haven't really tried out is the uh, Infinite Track Fortress Megaclops. I haven't pulled or crafted this card yet. To be fair... I don't, I couldn't even really tell you a game state where I've had three Xyz monsters, but I've also not gone out of my way to try to get there. Um, this card is not a bad Towers, but it is a very conditional one. It's only unaffected by monster effects, and even then it can still be affected by Xyz effects. Um, but it's definitely not bad at all. Um, you definitely have the room in the extra deck for it, so if you do already own a copy, I would say definitely play it. But if you're like me and you don't own a copy... I wouldn't really be in a rush to like craft it for specifically for this deck, right? So the extra deck is like pretty much everything you would expect to see. Um, we have our Zoo decks. Uh, the only one of us I play are Borbo and Hammer Kong. I have kind of considered a second Borbo, but the thing is, you usually don't need to because Borbo is used exactly for going for Zeus, right? So uh, you really usually only need the one to set up your Zeus. Um, and then Hammer Kong is literally just a filler for the Zeus line. Uh, I wouldn't go into Hammer Kong unless you're going to make a Zeus, but you need to be stacking one of each Zodiac monster to get the Zeus up to six materials, so that's why we play Hammer Kong. Uh, we play two of each of Tiger Mortar, Chakanine, and Dryden because those do actually have some uh, legit applications. Dryden, of course, is our, our main piece of interaction during our opponent's turn. Uh, Chakanine can be used to, for the line where you go into the F-Zeros, right? Uh, and then Tiger Mortar just it can really help in grind games. Uh, I've definitely had games where having Tiger Mortar did super matter. I think we might even have one of those in this video. Uh, we'll see. Uh, and then, yeah, the last two extra X slots here. Of course, we also have the one of each of the Kashira Xyzes and then the Zeus as well. And then our last few slots here, aside from the F-Zeros, are just going to be for Baron de Fleur and Donner. Uh, Baron, of course, we could th feasibly make with the Kashira plus Ash Blossom. And then Donner just, like, generally, you know... If you need a link to that pops a card, you can have it. But again, uh, you could very easily play Mega Clops over either of these. I probably played over Baron de Fleur. I don't know, actually. Maybe Donnery doesn't even come up that much. I think mean, neither of these really come up at all, to be fair. So, uh, like I said, the extra deck does have some room for flexibility if you uh, are looking for some different cards. But I think that covers everything I wanted to talk about the build. So let's break it down card by card, and then I'll show you some duels. We're on two Effect Failure, three Maxi, three Ash Blossom, and a Joy Spring. One Zodiac Rapier, two Zodiac Whiptail, two Zodiac Thoroughblade, two Zodiac Ram Ram, one Cashier Riseheart, two Dimension Shifter, one 
Cashier at Fenrir, three Cashier at Unicorn, one Nibiru the Primal Being, two Troll Tactics Talent, one Cashier at Theosis, one Pressured Planet Rate Soth, three Fire Formation Tenki, three Zodiac Barrage, one Cashier of Birth, two Called by the Grave, one Cross Eye Designator, and then three Infinite Impermanence, and that's going to be our main deck. For the extra, we're on one Baron de Fleur, one number F0 Utopic Future, one number F0 Utopic Draco Future. Uh, we got two Zodiac Tiger Mortar, two Zodiac Trident, one Zodiac Borbo, one Zodiac Hammer Kong, two Zodiac Shock and Nine, one Kashira Shangri Era, one Kashira Arise Heart, one Divine Arsenal Ah, Zeus, Sky Thunder, and then finally one Donner Dagger for Hire. Uh, that'll be it for the list. Let's see some duels now. Okay, so our first opponent for this duel is going to be playing the Red Slash Resonator deck. With the new support, of course. And this will definitely demonstrate, I think, the kind of grind game that you can expect to get into while playing this deck here. Uh, no cash shares, we're only going to be opening some Zodiacs here. And the opponent's also going to max here as soon as we summon Ram Ram. Uh, I will still make a Dryden here, just because that's better than nothing. I would do that even if I didn't have Triple Attack, but... We do have triple attack, so we can take a peek at our opponent's hand and see what's going on here. I uh, just want to make sure we pause it when it's revealed. Okay, so opponent's working with Synchron Resonator, Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, uh, Resonator Call, Infinite Permanence, and Fiendish Golem. Uh, sometimes if you're hand ripping a deck that you're not very familiar with, it can be a little bit difficult to tell what you need to take. Um, and I think the best way to, to help with that, and I think also the best way to do hand rip effects in general, is to not try to pick out the one card you think is most important, but rather do process of elimination, right? So looking at my opponent's hand here, uh, I see Ash Blossom and Imperm. That's a little annoying, but I'm not comboing anymore this turn, so, and these don't advance their board state, so they can keep those. Uh, again, even if you're not familiar with the card, just read it. Fiendish Golem, I'm reading this card, okay. This is just if I control a 2000 or attack monster, they can temporarily banish it. It's actually really annoying for an Xyz deck, but fine, they can keep it. It's not going to advance their board state. Synchron Resonator. If Synchron Monsters on the field, you can special summon this card. This is the Graveyard Target of Resonator. Okay, reading this card, it's pretty obvious it doesn't do anything by itself. Therefore, by process of elimination, the last card that I haven't talked about yet, Resonator Call, which adds any Resonator monster from deck to hand, definitely seems like the best choice. If I know they can't combo with the other four cards in hand, let's definitely take out the Searcher. Uh, again, I think that's the best way to do hand rip effects. Uh, whether whether you know the deck or not that you're playing against, just do process of elimination and pick out the least important ones first. It'll make it much easier to figure out what you need moving forward. Uh, opponent did top deck Soul Resonator, which would have been one card plays if it weren't for my infinite impermanence here. So thank god we had that in addition to the Dryden. They're also using the Imperm against the Dryden. That's great. I love to see it. Um, they do get to battle over it, which is a little annoying, but I have more Zodiacs, I don't really care. I know this is Fiendish Golem. Uh, this is one thing that I love about Triple Attack. Not only is it really good going first or second, but when you do the Hand Rip Effect, the information that you get, it's like so, like, a lot of people kind of undervalue that aspect of a Hand Rip. Like, not only do you take one card, but the information that you have is going to help you throughout the whole rest of the duel. Because now I know that my opponent has an Ash Blossom in hand, and also that this is Fiendish Golem, and I can play around both. Particularly, I can play around the Fiendish Golem, right? Because normally, I would definitely just set up a Zeus here. Um, oh, I'm using Wrap here to thin my deck a little bit, because I do want to find, uh, ideally, some part of my Castera package. Uh, because I'm about to use my second Dryden here, and I'm not sure how long I can ride that Dryden um, to victory. But it's actually going to be a little bit longer than I expected, but yeah, here's us using Tiger Mortar here. I'm going to pick back up the Ram Ram from my uh, uh, graveyard here to give my... And also equip Whiptail from hand, because Whiptail does have that effect. Whiptail also has the effect, which I find to be very, very relevant a lot of the time, that whenever it battles a monster, uh, it, uh, the Xyz monster that's underneath, it actually banishes it. Uh, the Ram Ram will also prevent it from being targeted by uh, trap cards. One important thing to know, though, is that it only gives it to an Xyz monster whose original type is Beast Warrior. So if I go into Zeus, it won't have target protection, and it's going to get Fiendish Golem here, right? So, uh, again, normally I would go into a Zeus and just call it there, but I know my opponent has Fiendish Golem, which will banish my Zeus, getting rid of all of its materials, and obviously do not want that to happen. So I'm going to sit on this Dryden and not go into the Zeus. Uh, this is how this information is so, so helpful, right? Uh, if I didn't know my opponent had a Fiendish Golem, I would have gone into Zeus and, and really gotten wrecked, honestly. Uh, but now I can set on this Dryden a much more 
uh, consistent form of, of disruption under the Fiendish Golem, and just call it there. Opponent did set a Vision Resonator they topped deck that's going to allow them to search the Crimson Gaia, but I'm actually not super concerned. I'm a little more worried if they ha happen to top deck like a Soul Resonator too, but... While Crimson Gaia can search, it's a continuous spell card, meaning if I destroy it with Dryden in response to the activation, it actually won't resolve. Uh, it's funny because MST doesn't negate is a meme in the Yu-Gi-Oh community, but fun fact, uh, and some players don't know this, uh, if you destroy a continuous spell or trap card or an equip spell or a field spell as it's resolving, it does not actually activate the effect. So it's like, level one thinking is, oh, I can use MST to negate a normal spell. Level 2 thinking is, oh no, MST doesn't negate spell and trap cards. Ah, but then there's level 3 thinking, which is like, well, MST can negate continuous spell and trap cards, and that's exactly what we did here. Alright, Unicorn obviously doesn't do much. I'm just going to slam down this throw blade and just battle into my opponent here. Not only does Unicorn not do much because we have monsters, but also, again, remember that Fiendish Golem can banish any monster with 2,000 or more attack points. Alright, opponent has top decked another relevant piece of disruption, the, or engine rather, the Bone Archfiend. I'm just going to pop it as soon as it's summoned, right? Again, I don't know exactly how they could combo with this uh, off the top of my head because I don't know this deck, but, you know, just reading it, I'm like, okay, it doesn't do anything if it gets destroyed, it does have an on-field effect that's not a quick effect. Yeah, let's just pop it and get rid of it, right? Uh, opponent's setting, I imagine this is probably going to be the Ash Blossom. Um, but we can actually still lethal our opponent even if it is, because I can just battle with one of my other monsters. Um, oh, here I decided to Theosis. Yeah, finally proccing the Fiendish Golem. But then they just can see because they realize, like, oh, it's useless. And even if the last face down monster was Ash Blossom, which I do believe it probably was, um, we could battle it with one of our monsters and then pop it during the battle phase uh, with Dryden and then swing in for lethal. So. Uh, there you go. That's that's a pretty textbook game of how Zodiac Kashira uh, plays its duels out. Um, and also just Zodiac in general, right? Uh, again, we're not doing any kind of fast OTKs. We're doing this kind of slow grind game, uh, controlling our opponent and maintaining our advantage while keeping them off of their own plays. So we, of course, do still have some more games to look at. Let's go ahead and check out the next one here. Okay, so uh, we're going to show off a game where we're going to be going second this time, and we're going to be playing against Super Heavy Samurai. Going second against Super Heavy Samurai is not a place I think a lot of people want to be. <laughs> okay, uh, we did draw both Valor and Nib, which actually presents an interesting option for us to disrupt them. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that, but I think I am going to end up taking here. So... Uh, Nib is pretty infamously not that great against this deck a lot of the time uh, because they can summon out their Baron de Fleur uh, before they even do their Pendulum Summon, which means they always have extension and always have plays uh, after you Nibiru, right? However, here I have opened both Nibiru and Valor. So rather than use Valor right on like just some random monster and then try to Nib later, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna nib while they have the Baron up and then use the Valor on the Baron on the floor. Now, I know that this deck can put out multiple Omni Negates, so I do have to be mindful of that, that I can only stop one Omni and not a second one. I'm thinking that Regulus is probably gonna be the next one that comes down, right? Uh, they'll probably pen to summon, or well, they'll make the Cleafor Genius, then pen to summon, uh, and then we'll need to Nibiru before the Regulus comes down. Uh, now, obviously, I didn't know this at the time, but looking back, uh, well, well, we'll we'll see here in a moment. I'll talk about that in a second. All right, so opponent's going to Peacemaker on the Samurai. Yep, scales, scales for the Soul Piercers. This is all pretty. If you've played Super Heavy Samurai, you know you know this line, or if you've played against it enough, even really. Okay, here's the Cleefort Genius, right? Soul Piercer's going to add a wagon again. I want them to pen to summon before I Nibiru. There we go. There it is. Because once they've Pendulum Summoned, after I wipe their board, their means of coming back is going to be a lot... We're going to have a lot less of it. Okay, I want a Nibiru now, because I know that Genius's effect is about to search out the Regulus. I could have waited until the chain resolved, actually, to be fair, but I would have just done it then anyway. It's not too much of a difference of timing here, so I'll just do it now. Uh, like I said, Valor's going to negate the Baron, and then we can nib their board. Give them a big old token. Alright, Genius does still resolve, even though it's not on the field anymore because the condition was already met of the monsters being pen summoned to the zones. They do get to summon the Regulus, we know this was going to happen. 
uh, equipping soul pierce. So they also have a magnum hut, uh, which we're going to use to grab a druid swarm, which is also well. Now they're grabbing druid swarm. It's a little bit more of a wrench than I expected to have to deal with, but it's not that big of a deal, all in all. So, all right, here I'm going to use my birth to normal summon out the unicorn. Actually, okay, I want to talk about this. So I was kind of worried about my opponent's um, uh, what's it called regulus here, right? But I realized, like, okay, I can actually birth and normal unicorn, battle, and then do my combos and not have to... Like, I can battle Nibiru over Regulus and then Unicorn over Magnum Hut, right? Uh, and then I won't have to worry about Regulus disrupting me. But my opponent actually took care of the Regulus for me. And they, they actually made a mistake that I've also made playing Sprite. So let's read the wording of Theron King Regulus. It says, when your opponent activates a card or effect, quick effect, you can send one Theron monster card from your hand or face up field to the graveyard. Negate that effect. Negate that effect. Now, Sprite Carrot is actually, and Red, are worded the exact same way, but most importantly, Carrot. So here's the thing when you activate a continuous spell card, right, and you have a negation effect that says to negate that effect, right, you can chain it because the opponent is activating a card or effect, but I'm not actually activating any effect of Cashier Birth right now. I'm literally just placing the card from my hand onto the field. Uh, and also, the effects to Normal Summon Unicorn isn't even an activated one. So here's the thing, right? You saw the animation go over my birth. But I'm still going to use it and summon Unicorn. And my opponent is probably wondering, well, what the heck is that all about? And you might be too. Uh, again, you just got to pay attention to the wording. Negate that effect. Uh, when your opponent activates a card or effect. So again, I activated a card, cast share birth, that fulfilled the condition of Regulus's Negate. But I'm not actually activating an effect, so this effectively just did nothing. Um, they should have waited. Well, then that's the thing, too. Like I said before, this first effect to normal summon level 7 monsters is also not an activated effect. So that wouldn't have even triggered the condition of Regulus uh, if it was still on the field. That's why I said I could activate birth, normal summon unicorn, battle, battle, then activate unicorn's effect and do combo lines. But again, my opponent just took care of the Regulus for me before I even moved to battle phase. Now, granted, they're going to have a Veiler anyway, so it kind of didn't matter in that regard. Well, actually, no, it did because I have cross as a deer. Never mind. Haha. -ha. <laughs> Oh, that's right, because this is also where I use Unicorn to eat their second uh, Scarecrow out of their extra deck. Also, looking at their extra deck here, this is what I was going to mention earlier. This is when I found out they were on a Calamity build, which is actually good news for me, because it means a lot of their extra deck isn't going to be that useful to them on the follow-up. So, more of the reason to take the second Scarecrow here uh, and just make their follow-up plays that much worse. They also had, like, Baguska and Zeus and Gear Gigant. So I kind of consider taking Zeus, I kind of consider taking one of their remaining Synchros, but I think Scarecrow makes the most sense to take if I'm going to board wipe them, which I have vague plans to. You might be noticing me summoning this era in attack mode. Uh, I'm not going for any cash Shiro lines here, but instead, uh, I'm going to end on Zeus plus Fenrir plus Unicorn. Now, obviously, I have to be mindful of when I want to Zeus here, and yeah, this Drew Swarm is going to throw a wrench into my plans to Zeus. Now, I do get to use Fenrir, and you might be thinking, okay, now you can use Fenrir and banish the Druid Swarm. And I kind of had the same thought, but I decided to banish the Wakaoshi instead. I think this might have been a misplay, though. I think what happened here is I thought I was going to get another chance to use Fenrir before my opponent, uh, you know, tri uh, forced me to Zeus, I totally forgot about the Nibiru token. Uh, you can't banish a Nibiru token with Fenrir as well, because the card has to be banished face down. Tokens cannot be banished face down, because tokens can't be face down. So, yeah, I, I should have hit the Druid Swarm here. I, I got a little greedy hitting the Pen Scale. Well, I didn't even, I just didn't even consider the Nibiru token. I just had totally forgotten about this big old rock sitting here, yeah. I'm gonna have to Zeus now, uh, which is not ideal, but it's not the end of the world either, uh, because the Druid Swarm does end up eating my Zeus as well. Uh, they're gonna normal summon scales, and my last card here is Maxi, which is why I'm not super duper concerned, right? Scales bringing back Soul Piercer, and they're ending right there, which is really, really good for me. Uh, and the Zodiac Whiptail was all I needed. One Zodiac monster was all I needed to top deck. Now I can normal summon my Zodiac, uh, and then go into the Tiger Mortar here. Now, remember that 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 effect of the Whiptail, right? 
This card battles an opponent's monster after damage calc. Banish that opponent's monster. Yeah! Like I said, that definitely comes up more often than you think it would. It's very, very relevant as we are able to banish the opponent's Soul Piercer, which not only prevents that search, but my opponent doesn't have another Soul Piercer in the graveyard. They don't have access to that card right now. Even if they did have it in the graveyard, remember that we banished their second Scarecrow, so that they wouldn't even be able to recur it very easily, at least. Also, I, I think this is their second copy of Scales, too, now that I think about it. It is, yeah. That doesn't even usually play two Scales, but they're out of that card for sure now. Uh, they are going to Valor my Dryden my attempt to pop it, but that's fine. We can just pop it later. It's not that big of a deal. Dryden is a little weak, but one thing you might not know about Whiptail, right? This effect to attach is a quick effect. And remember that as soon as it attaches, it will apply the attack buff. So my plan here was to leave the Dryden in attack mode. Well, obviously also 400 defense, lower than 800 attack. But if my opponent did try to summon something with less than 2400 attack to battle over Dryden, I could just attach this during the battle phase after the attack is declared and then just battle over their thing. So when they go to end phase, I know they're not going to play anything else. I'll then pop these scales just to get, you know, in the monster off the field. No reason not to. Triple attack. Not a bad draw. I'm just going to summon, yeah, Whiptail and then they concede. Um, I'm trying to remember, actually. I don't think Dryden is, like, I think it's a soft once per turn. It is. So I could have multiple copies of Dryden, which is probably how I would have ended, uh, rather than going into the F-Zero, right? Against a Pendulum deck especially, I think multiple pops is better than just having the uh, one monster effect negate. The F-Zero line, I don't know. I, I, if, I go for this on turn one sometimes. Um, if you have Thoroughblade plus Ram Ram, you can do it on turn one. That's probably the best time to do it. I will say, like, F-Zero is good, but in a lot of times, especially in grind games, which this deck does get into a lot, it doesn't always come up. But I think it's still good to include. Uh, we actually have two more duels to show off still, uh, so let's take a look at the next one here. Okay, this next one is going to be against Snake Eye. A pretty interesting variant. This is Fur Higher Snake Eye. So, uh, I think we're going second again here. Yep, going second. Which again, a deck like this doesn't really care about a lot. We are opening up our Shifter here. It's not too shabby here. Uh, you'll notice I didn't shotgun the Shifter right away. Uh, because, I, I, I don't know. I don't play with this card a lot, but the way that I do like to play with it is that I prefer to... It's kind of like Maxi in a way, right? Like, yeah, you can shotgun this card during your opponent's draw phase, but then your opponent has knowledge of it and they can play around it. Um, whereas, if you wait a little bit, you can get your opponent in a situation where they've already used some of their resources and then they're not able to use those for a potential follow-up turn. So here, after the original Sin is set, now I'm going to use my D-Shifter. Because here's the thing about the original Sin, right? Um, if you look at this card and you look at the cost, it says send another face of card you control to the graveyard. Um, they actually cannot activate this while Dimension Shifter's effect is applied, uh, because the cost of the card requires you to send a card to the graveyard exactly, but while the Shifter is active, cards can't go to the graveyard, they get banished instead, so... It's not even that my opponent didn't want to play into D-Shifter, they just couldn't. And if I had shotgun D-Shifter during the draw phase here, then uh, they would have been able to hang on to the Diabello and just use it on a follow-up turn. That's why I like to hang on to Shifter for at least a little bit and just let them see, not only just see what they're up to, but also let them commit a little bit to it, right? Because you could also end up in a situation where, oh, here I should have just battled over Diabello instead of attacking directly. If I was going to attach Whiptail anyway, then I could have battled into and also banished the Abel. Well, I guess I'm going to banish the Abel either way. Oh, actually, I want to talk about this. So, this looks really weird, probably, that I'm going to use Dryden before I go into Zeus, but I think it's important to do so, and here's why. Uh, because I attach Whiptail, if I just go into Zeus, then it'll be a 7 material Zeus, which is a little bit awkward, but I can use the extra material on Dryden to pop Diabel here. Uh, Diabel will get banished, so it won't trigger the second effect, right? Not only that, but now my opponent has a face-down original sin that they can't use without committing a face-up monster to the field, which does actually put them in a bit of a precarious situation, right? Once I have the Zeus online. Now it means they have to eat their normal summon to even have the opportunity to use original sin, but of course, I'm just going to use the Zeus as soon as they summon a monster anyway. Whereas, if I left Diabelle alone, they could have flipped original sin, uh, then I probably would have Zeus, and then they still would have had a normal summon, right? So... I guess to be fair, getting rid of it here, the original Sin, would have also banished it. 
Mm, I should consider that a little bit more. But anyway, here they're going to summon Poplar and add another original sin. That does make things a little bit more awkward if I want to just, you know, use Zeus now they have another copy in hand. But I think I am still going to Zeus when this Poplar places itself. Yeah. Because now they still have to commit a summon before they can even activate original sin. And now they're going to use the graveyard effect, which is totally fine with me. Yeah, they can add a Poplar and special it here, but it's already used both of its other effects. So I don't really care about that. A rookie for hire is going to tribute it and then summon out... Uh, hang on. Which, which one is this? Donpa. So this is why you want to read cards if you're not familiar with the archetype. Because at first I was like, ah, oh, it's just one monster. I'm sure I can let it go. But I was like, wait, let me actually read it here. So they can special for hire from hand. And then if they do, they can destroy a face-up card on the field. Yeah, I definitely do not want my Zeus to get destroyed. So let's board wipe all Donpas in play. Also, they have used their normal summon now. So now that they can't special off of Donpa, yeah, they're out of plays. All right, so they do have a maxi in response to my normal summon, Ram Ram. I'm just going to triple attack and hand rip here, because I know one of the cards is original sin. I just want to see what the other one is. It turns out to be Mayhem Fur Hire, which lets them reborn a Fur Hire monster, of which there are two in the yard. So I'm definitely going to put this back, and then they can only have original sin in hand. And now they're completely reliant on their top deck, and I still have a board wipe left on my Zeus. This is, again, another way in which these games with this deck often play out, just this total Zeus board control situation. The opponent ended up top decking a Fossil Dig, which is actually a really insanely good top deck for them. Uh, they get to add Rex for hire, uh, Normal Summon to add another Rookie for hire from deck to hand. Um, I'm going to Zeus now, um, and they're going to chain the Rookie for hire, because that is a quick play spell. Uh, but this means I do get to wipe whatever gets summoned on resolution. Now their last card in hand is Original Sin, yeah, they can't do anything, so... There we have it. All right. Um, let's see. I think that's actually... You know what? I have one more game to show, I think. Yes, I do. Yep. Let's go ahead and uh, finish off with that one. All right. Our last duel here is against um, some sort of a machine combo deck. I'm not exactly sure uh, what was going on. I mean, it, it might be a standard Earth machine. I'm not, like, the most familiar with that deck. But I think it was also playing some Snake Eye stuff, maybe? I don't remember. We'll see. Uh, going second, yet again, going to start with Scrap Recycler, sending the Jet Synchron, discarding the uh, O-Lion. That way they get the token here as well. But I'm definitely going to max C now, because the token is about to come out here. Now, the reason I like to wait sometimes a little bit with max C, because you may be thinking like, oh, if you had shotgun max C, you wouldn't have missed the draw with the Diabell Star. I'm not really concerned about missing draws here, because I already have a Ram Ram, so I know I have plays when it comes to my turn, right? Um, furthermore, by waiting here, we kind of made our opponent commit to the board a little more, which, especially in a deck that wants to go into Zeus a lot, if it's going second, uh, is definitely better. That's also, again, why I like waiting on the D-Shifter, too. So, setting Silvara and another card before passing. Uh, the interesting thing about Silvara is that we can actually play around it with Ram Ram, because Ram Ram makes whatever... Um, Beast Warrior Xyz has it attached as a material, uh, immune to targeting trap cards, right? So. Alright, uh, I'm gonna start by making Dryden here, and I'm gonna use Dryden to pop the Diabell. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because not only does it force out this effect, well, okay, actually, bleh, that went by really quickly, let me talk about this. So, I wanted to pop Diabell to force its effect and force them to send the Scrap Recycler, um, and I don't know. Well, okay, really my plan was to try to get it off the field, um, so that way they couldn't Silvara. Because they can't Silvara my Zodiac Xyz monsters, but they can Silvara my Zeus. And I don't want that to happen, ideally. So, but I was, but you know, I realized, like, ah, even if I pop it with Dryden, they can still bring it back. And I was like, well, you know what, even if they do that, then at least they'll have one less body on the board. So I decided to do that line anyway, but luckily for me, they actually chose to send the token instead. So you may be wondering why Diabell isn't on the field. Let's read Diabell Star. During your opponent's turn, this card is sent from the hand or field to the graveyard. You can send, you can send one card from your hand or field to the graveyard. And if you do, special summon this card. And if you do, two very important words. Uh, my opponent elected to send a token, which was their downfall. Tokens do not go to the graveyard. So, they did not send a card to the graveyard, ergo, they cannot special summon this card. 
The wording, I've noticed, has come up a lot. The wording of abilities has come up a lot in this video. That's definitely something that's very important to pay pay attention to. And it's it's kind of why Yu-Gi-Oh! sometimes has this reputation of uh, being a TCG for lawyers. <laughs> you know, win versus if, and if you do, all that fun stuff. It's nice to be able to actually put my English degree to use. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so... Uh, I'm gonna try it, uh, or not try it. I'm gonna Zeus Feather. The other face down was Imperm. This is totally fine because I know the last card is Silvara, so I don't even feel the need to like do the other board wipe in response to the Imperm. I'll just wait. I'll just wait for them to commit more to the board. Uh, they're gonna Jet Sync around and pitch the Ash Blossom, and then now I'll Zeus to board wipe. Now they only have one card left in hand. It's actually Thrust, but I was gonna say I have Valor and Ash Blossom. Like, there's nothing they could have. There's no one card they could realistically have that could play through both Valor and Ash Blossom here. And yeah, as you can see, they're out of both cards on, uh, they have cards rather on both hand and field, and as a result, they are now surrendering. That's, again, that is how control decks win the duel more times than not, um, is just by grinding your opponent down to nothing, and then, uh, yeah, you just went out from there. Okay, so that's gonna do it for this video. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. I had a ton of fun playing this deck, and you know, I gotta say, I should probably bust this deck out more often, because I I'm not joking, every time I do, I just have, like, such a high win rate. It's it's kind of wild. Um, and, yeah, it sounds like uh, it sounds like you all have been having a lot of success with it, too. Um, but, like I said, that'll do it for this one. Uh, let's move now to our outro. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. That means a lot to me. Uh, it's also a great way to support the channel, so thank you very much for in that way as well. Uh, if you're interested in supporting the channel in other ways, uh, like the very special patrons that I am thanking here, uh, you can do so by checking out some of the links in the description. One of those goes to the Patreon, uh, where you can join these fine folk and support the channel that way. I do post daily content over on Patreon, so uh, you do get something for support there and if you're interested I also have a coaching tier option uh, as well details again will be on patreon in the link below uh, also in the description linked below is my twitch page where I stream uh, a few times a week you can go ahead and check that out follow or subscribe over there uh, if you ever want to catch me live uh, you'll also find my second YouTube channel if you feel like subscribing over there to watch some of the twitch vods as well as some additional uh, non Yu-Gi-Oh related content that I make over there. Uh, again, any of those links you want to check out is all a great way uh, of supporting. But again, even if you don't do that, just watching was also a fantastic way to support. And once again, I have to thank you so very much. But uh, in any case, this is Hexlex. I'm going to be signing out and I'm hoping you have a fantastic day.